So um, we have a, a very good panel here. I just want to start by uh, making a, a, a few questions um, based, I think, particularly on what was said this morning, but also the amazing previous two days. Um, I, think, I think one of the key challenges of our time is to deeply transform finance, to radically transform finance from kind of a bad master to a good servant. Uh, so the first is to serve the real economy, and that's what this conference is about. But also so it doesn't harm the real economy. And I, I think that what we have been talking about here is, is, is good. Glass-Steagall is fine, but we have to go beyond, as Randy said. For example, do we just separate speculation, or do we curb it? Do we ban certain things? When they have no social purpose, but they have um, potentially very high costs, like we do with drugs, maybe we should ban things. And this is, of course, very radical. And because it's very radical, we have to think about the politics of how to achieve that. And that's why I really like uh, the point about democracy, how we mobilize democracy, um, how we mobilize uh, thinking to, uh, to, to radically fi mobilize uh, change finance. Because if we don't do that, you're wasting all the resources that could be used potentially for the transformative mission-oriented finance um, to, to have a model like, like Mariana has been arguing for, Carlota, uh, very clearly um, explain a kind of green development model and lifestyle, but we need, um, we need a, fun a, a financial system that is functional. And secondly, I just want to reiterate that we seem to have instruments that work. We know what doesn't work, but we seem to have instruments that work, and we've had very eloquent presentations on the development banks. And I would argue that what I, one of the things I've learned at this conference is that scale is important, scale in proportion to the total financial system. And that's why KFW, Ben Desse are such good examples, because they, uh, they are such a large proportion of the financial system. And then they can also uh, have a big impact on the real economy. And I think one of the challenges in Europe is, for example, to increase the role of the European Investment Bank, as an example, both for counter-cyclical purposes, but also for generating the innovation and the job creation. So I have a proposal that they should further increase the capital of the IB by a mere 10 billion euros, which is peanuts. Um, and secondly, I think that there's a major challenge for the kind of Anglo-Saxon uh, financial system, which don't actually have proper development banks. A lot of African and Latin American countries also don't have how they can create large development banks and what can, what can they learn from the successful ones? What is the politics of challenging the power of vested interests and doing the things that work, that we see that are right, and restricting, banning the things that uh, cannot work? So how can we, to put the title, uh, use the state as both market shaper and creator. And we have four excellent speakers. They've asked to change the order a bit, so we will start with Leonardo Burlamaki, who you all know and who's done excellent work, uh, both as a researcher and as running this Ford network, which has produced such interesting results. So, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, my I'm not going to talk about democracy, at least uh, not in this presentation, but I think it will link well with some of the discussions uh, from the previous panel. So my, my paper has basically two messages. Uh, one, and I'm starting. Oops. Uh. I'll start to run because it's 12 minutes, maybe 11. So two messages. First one. Schumpeter, Keynes, Minsky, and Hilferding are all alive and well, <laughs> and they live in China. The second message is that China has done so well in so many fronts uh, in the last three decades, if you will, largely due to the fact that it is a fully developed 
entrepreneurial states. And that's something that I want to try to build up a little bit. So it's, it's going to be more on the conceptual side of the story. Uh, and I'll give you just a snapshot of what I'm trying to do. Those two quotes here are very well known. Where is the state here in the first? Well, who organizes, who enforces, who regulates the money markets? The state. How can we tame? How, how, how capitalism can, can be tamed? Largely by means of socializing investment. So I think those two things enable us to begin to think about the, uh, the entrepreneurial state. And the main message uh, here would be this, in terms of key propositions, right? The first one is that, the, like I said, uh, from a theoretical point, point of view, China's achievements, uh, they recover a lot uh, or some of the key elements of those thinkers. And also, obviously, it's a sort of a reincarnation and on steroids of the Asian uh, model of developmental state. So China is precisely that. And it brings with it uh, a lot of implications for public policy and for economic analysis. And again, uh, China was uh, able to not only uh, come close, but in some instances and in some, uh, in some fronts, some areas, to leapfrog its uh, peers because of the, the, the fact that it is an entrepreneurial state. And again, uh, I'll try to build this in terms of uh, a concept. So instead of using entrepreneurial state as a descriptive device, my attempt is to propose to you that it should be regarded as a bridging, a core bridging concept in this Schumpeter, Keynes, Minsky synthesis that is, let's say, under construction in, in those projects that are coming from INAT, Ford, etc. So the core, uh, the, the concept of entrepreneurial state in that sense should combine uh, three elements, finance, innovation, and socialization of investment. Those three things, have to, they, they would have to be together in order to synthesize entrepreneurial state as a concept. Let me underline that, not as a descriptive device only. And let me also say what I think is the obvious, but it's not there. I think the state, entrepreneurial or not, should be a key element in any empirically relevant theory of economic development. And it is not. It's there, but it's not in the theory. And this is crazy, because the state is always there. And it's not in the theory. Okay. So how do we do that? OK, the three elements uh, in a snapshot. Well, finance, I would say, well, a Hilferding Schumpeter type of banking system, which is precisely this one that Ricardo just mentioned, which, well, the banker uh, is the one who ends up with the animal spirits. The risks are in the bank. This is the type of finance capitalism described by Hilferding and Schumpeter. It has nothing to do with modern gambling. So this sort of financial system has to be in place because it will serve development, it will serve innovation, it will protect and create employment. The second point, innovation. Okay, innovation, in that, I think we should, we, we, we have to do something that Schumpeter himself already started, which is to extend his own ideas uh, about entrepreneurial skills and the role of the entrepreneur to the state. Where did Schumpeter did that? Not discussing capitalism in his capitalism, socialism, democracy, but discussing socialism. When he discusses socialism, he's basically uh, uh, bringing to the state the function of entrepreneur in chief. And I think we all know that the, the question he begins, uh, can socialism work? Answer, of course it can. Uh, it can and it can beat capitalism on the grounds of economic efficiency. And the discussion that follows in socialism is largely about what we would l see today in the Asian uh, developmental states, in the Asian countries, and I would say particularly in China. And 
the, the third, the, the other point, which is the, the, the socialization of investment. Then I think we have to merge Keynes ideas uh, from the general tree, theory with the same discussion that Schumpeter's carries out in those chapters, I think are 16 and 17 of, of the 40, 40, 1942 book, which basically has to do with redesigning the frontiers or the boundaries in between public and private spheres and making development, making uh, employment, and, 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 and making, let's say, well, the whole dynamics of innovation a public concern and a public mission. So that is already in what Keynes talks about when Keynes talks about socialization of investment, he is largely talking about that. When Schumpeter discusses socialism, I would say it's more or less the same. So those two things, has to, they have to be brought together, okay? And then we would have a much more interesting picture of how to understand this spectacular transformation that Asia and now China, in especially China, but all Asia, brought uh, about in the last, well, maybe century, if we, if we start with uh, Meiji, the, the Meiji re Revolution in Japan, okay? So, uh, if you have that, you have uh, um, uncertainty or risk taking, but more than that, uncertainty uh, reduction, because uh, the, 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 this financial system is there. Now, we have rapid productivity growth and export, and we also have something that I would like to, to, to call creative destruction management. Because uh, Schumpeter was not only the guy, the creation, creative destruction guy, he was also the one who discussed how creative dis destruction could be uh, uh, managed if you had a proper state and the cooperation that Keynes also mentions in between state uh, or public and private agencies. You can smooth the way the cleaning can be done, the depression uh, that you mentioned, Brandy. The depression does the cleaning, but the cleaning can be managed. So you would have, uh, with that, you have the managed structural change. Not only structural change, which is the main Trumpeterian message, but uh, managed structural change. Okay, how do we translate those four elements to China? Okay, in finance, well, a financial system that basically works uh, to, for development and for innovation. The public banks, the policy banks uh, are there basically to do that, right? They are not, again, nothing like the modern gambling that we have in place in most of the Western world. It's a different, completely different financial system. Uh, innovation, the government as entrepreneur in chief and not only the government, but, but the government is like the commanding heights of the, at the commanding heights of the system, right? And in terms of socialization of investment, the idea is basically forging the future, designing the future. This is not a task that has, that, that should be left only to the private uh, interests or to the private firms or to, or, or to markets. It has to be a joint thing. And again, especially when private finance retired from the task of financing, financing in, uh, investment and innovation, who has to be there? Well, public agencies and the state. So, uh, we have there uh, then policy banks, the development banks, the public special investment uh, vehicles, strategic industrial policy and, and, and innovation policy coming directly from the state, and we have pilot agencies, which is crucial for a developmental state, like Chalmers Johnson said it, and it's still true. Well, the, the, the Communist Party Standing Committee, the State Council, and the, the, the China Central Bank, th those are pilot agencies. And how, what kind of outcomes do we have from this? Well, stable funding, and as I said, animal spirits originating from the banks, in the banks, not exactly on the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs are not the ones who are losing money. If a, a bank like that is the one who loses the money if the, if, if the, the, the project uh, fails. So w you have a different sort of institutional design there. Uh, 
Innovation, well, from that perspective, you have, you, 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 you can think directly uh, about state-sponsored Schumpeterian agendas like the, the plans, the five-year plans, or the big one, which is the China 2030 that was jointly elaborated uh, by the State Council in consultation with both, again, public and private uh, agencies, corporations, etc. But the state is there. Again, entrepreneur in chief. And socialization of uh, investment here, again, pilot agencies, institutional cooperation, uh, robust regulation, and a system of govern interdependence in the sense that there is interdependence or to put in Peter Evans' terms, embedded autonomy, where you have a link in between private and public, but the public is the one who really shapes the future, okay? So just to finish up, so that would be in, 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 as a snapshot, snapshot, uh, uh, sort of a very crude representation of what, what we could call uh, the sort of the, the backbone of China's entrepreneurial state. And just, just really to close this, uh, this thing that Minsky uh, wrote in 86, almost 30 years ago, task ahead is to precisely try to link the insights from uh, Schumpeter's about uh, the whatever innovation, creative destructions, etc., with Keynes. We are so much behind the curve in that task, but, well, we're doing it. We're just beginning, but we're doing that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leonardo. Very interesting. Um, and so now we have Dan Bresnitz. Okay, as we wait, I just want to show some. I, I do own the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's actually good, I think, that I'm after Leonardo because I think we have complementary but slightly differing view, specifically about how the state can be entrepreneurial and effective over time. Um, so what I'm actually going to say, uh, and this is a recent stream that I have been working with Darius Ornston, who finally joined me in Toronto after running around several universities in the US, uh, about how do you structure an agency that can really create or has been creating uh, innovation-based growth transformation in economies that didn't have were not innovation-based. So first of all, I'm going to discuss those points. So what is the logic of rapid innovation-based growth? Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, our concept of the Schumpeterian development agencies. Um, talk to you about why Chalmers Johnson might have been right, but is now wrong, and also Peter Evans and some of the other friends. And then suggest something else. Tell you why it works. I uh, give you one example because we're out of time and talk about the conclusion. So, first of all, let's remember what is a big difference if you want to have innovation-based growth or if you're Japan after World War II. If you want to have real innovation-based growth, your aim as an entrepreneurial mastermind is to create actors that will do things that you don't know what they're going to do in industries that do not yet exist, markets are not there, and nobody even knows the product or the business model. If, on the other hand, you want to have an economic growth development in an old industry or an industry that you know what it is, like the car industry, it is clear where are the markets, what are the products, you can then work on the business model and figure out new modes of production, but you know what the car is. And that's a very different strategic game to be played. Uh, and what you have to do in that strategic uh, game is actually to commit yourself to cont continuous policy experimentation uh, with the ability to kill, which is as important as the ability to come with new ideas. And you have to come up with radical ideas, and many of the time, since you don't have those actors in your system, come up with new partners. Do you hear me at all? No, okay. Um, 
I'm usually the one that demand one of those because I like to walk, so I'll stop, try to stay in one place. Um, the conventional answer is indeed Chalma Johnson as, and his friends and followers, and that is that what you need is to create, have a very a central commitment, create a huge pilot agency which is centralized, it, it is then therefore isolated from political pressure of all kinds, can make plans, organize everybody and run the game. And uh, it has been proven to be very good in case of follow-up or catching up. Uh, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, it has not been very good in actually moving the economy into innovation-based. And therefore came the conventional answer number two, which is Peter Evans, Ansel, Block, um, Sean Orion, and that says, what you really have is to have this bureaucracy, but it has to be fused with the industry and networked both inside and outside the state, but still you have to have the central agency strong, committed, powerful. Um, well, that might be true, but if you look at the cases where you have true transformation into innovation, uh, it does not explain where those radical ideas come from. Uh, and it also does not explain why many of those countries, and I'll talk about Israel and Finland, uh, actually started to be much less innovative. So the entrepreneurial state became less entrepreneurial as it actually succeeded. Um, so what we actually claim that if you look over time, uh, where you see the creation of those ideas that then become the new model, they started in peripheral agencies that had few hard resources uh, and they're actually less vulnerable for political intervention for a few reasons. A, they're just not important. So with powerful players, A, those are entities that have no status and very few financial resources. Why should they even bother? The second is because those agencies, not all those agencies, but some of those agencies that were committed to innovation, all the policy tools were already taken. All the major players were already taken. Uh, therefore, if you wanted to do something, you have to seek up new players, both inside and outside your economy, and you have to come up with new ideas. Even more importantly, so you created exactly this network that Block and others talk about because you were in the periphery. Um, and the other nice thing about this is your inability to protect successful projects. So as they become successful, the powerful actor said, Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you so much for it. I'll take it and scale it up now. And you have to reinvent yourself. And that is at least as important because you have to have constant experimentation. And indeed, what I'll show in one case, once you're successful and everybody wants you, you stagnate because your ability to innovate and fail and truly experiment goes down sharply. Uh, so let's talk about Israel and the historical context. In 68, uh, in the whole civilian sector, Israel has 886 R&D workers with any academic education. My guess is if we add this floor and a few other floors behind in this building, we have more people with academic education. Um, between 78 and 86, inflation was more than 109,000%. Uh, by 2000, however, IT, just IT export, are 71 of industrial exports. And even more importantly, if we talk about entrepreneurial investments, growth, 70% of GDP growth is from new startups. So it really is the engine of the economy. Uh, and right now, Israel, and I'm, I'm saying it uh, with sad face as a Canadian, Israel is now number two in the number of startups on Nasdaq. It used to be the US and then Canada, now it's the US. And Israel, Israel, let's just remember, has uh, about six million, seven million top people. Uh, how did it all start? It started in 68, 
There was a creation of Office of Chief Scientist. It was so peripheral that it didn't have even a full-time employee. It was a professor from a Hebrew University who walked twice a week for a few hours to the office and basically did nothing. 74 comes the first real chief scientist recruited from uh, when he retired from the defense industry. And the first thing he, uh, defense, sorry, the military, the first thing that he does is that this idea of public research institution is a really bad idea. I'm taking all the money and I'm putting it into helping private companies. He didn't ask anyone, there was no law. He just could do it because nobody cared what happened. Um, he then started the R&D general fund that, and goes around the country trying to convince startups and small, medium-sized enterprises that actually it's a good idea to do R&D and I'll give you money to lower the risk. If you're successful, you're going to repay me the loan. If you're not successful, too bad for me. So purely risk reduction. In 76, another institution which basically do as a division of labor, between Israeli and American companies, where Israeli companies should do the R&D, American companies should do the product definition and sales, and again, reduction of risk just on the R&D. Um, 84, finally, this whole activity is not shrined in law. And in 91, with the Russian immigration to Israel, a window of opportunity in three programs that the chief scientists actually thought about for several years was started and completely end the transformation of a system. The R&D consortia, the incubation system, which is all around the country, and Yuzma, which people constantly talked about because it's maybe the only successful VC creation initiative in the world, and it was in a very specific time done in a very specific way. Uh, and now we don't. Oh. So the benefits of marginalization, if you look at it, I don't know what you can see, but basically what you see is you actually have more resources and even more importantly, and that's other thing that I want to explain about marginalization, this is actually taken. So this is money from successful projects. So the actual government allocation to the chief scientist is extremely small, even when it was growing. Um, but what happened as the industry became the mainstay of the economy, uh, politicians started to intervene. The budget was stagnant, actually went down. And even not uh, as a direct intervention, you can, as a government, do certain things. For example, decide that from now on, it's the chief scientists that have to finance the EU framework, and boom, 25% of your budget is no longer your responsibility to allocate. It's, you supposedly have this budget, but somebody else decided where it goes. Uh, and when trying to innovate, even with a new program for the traditional industry that the prime minister says it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened, zero new budget allocation. You have to take for your remaining budget of what you have, which you're still allowed to reallocate. So a lot of problems to actually innovate immediately when you became central. And this is, you know, in graph, what happens to money. Um, Finland, no time, ask me questions. Uh, but basically the same story. Uh, conclusion and the current future. So first of all, if you try to figure it out and see where those entrepreneurial state, where those radical models and ideas come from, you find out that before the central agency, there was something in the periphery that actually did the experimentation and the radical thinking and created the network. Um, it also showed the importance of institutionalization and patience. It's very nice to have huge budgets, but it's much more important to have reasonable budgets that allow you to seed and start over time, 20 or 30 years. Uh, the periphery offers the best conditions for constant experimentation and structuring uh, new networks of different players. It also allows you to fail. If you are the central agency that the Politburo just said, the future of China, it is your new program. Even if it's a horrific failure, it's politically impossible to kill it. Um, the future question, however, if we are correct, is okay, back in 68, both in Israel and Finland, innovation was, <coughs> so you can do this thing. 
Right now, as we just heard, it's the EU. How do you allow those conditions that allow you to experiment if this is your main state? Uh, and if you cannot, what can you do that would allow you to experiment over time? And with that question, I'll stop. Um, well, thank you very much, Dan, for those challenging ideas. Um, and we now have Gaetano Pena, who is uh, a colleague at Sussex, at SPRU, and who's just been writing a paper with Mariana on, I think, the subject he's going to present. Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending our conference. Very glad to be presenting our work here. Uh, this presentation is based on a paper that Mariana and I have been developing uh, in the past uh, year and a half. Uh, we have struggled with it. That we had many pieces of the puzzle, and I think that finally we managed to put these pieces together. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the framework we are developing that tries to go beyond the market failure perspective. And today I'll be talking about the roles of, the, of state investment banks in the economy and also about the, the rise of the mission-oriented state investment bank, as we call. So m the motivation for, for this paper is something that has been discussed over and again today, which are some stylized facts that can be summarized by the idea of Minsky's uh, money-managed capitalism. So the issue of financi financialization, short-termism, the issue that venture capital is not providing the funding for the innovation that is required to promote innovation-led growth, and the issue of corporate governance, the fact that uh, even the real sector is, is financialized and focused on uh, maximizing shareholder value. And in then what results is that there is a, a, a lack of finance, long-term patient finance, to fund the capital development of the economy. And this retreat of private finance leads to a need for more public finance, for public finance to step in. This is not something new, that's something that uh, happens uh, every time and throughout capitalism history. And for instance, the one key source of public finance are state investment banks, also known as development banks, development finance institution, export import banks, and many other names. For the purpose of our research, we are considering them all as the same. Some authors also consider the industrial banks from the 19th century as development banks. We are focusing on the modern banks. So what are the roles of development bank in the economy? We identify actually five, four roles that they perform. The first role is that of counter-cyclical lending uh, to offset the credit crunch during economic recessions. We call it the counter-cyclical role that was one of the original roles of uh, many development banks founded uh, in the immediate post-war, like uh, IBRD, KFW, to provide a uh, constant flux of finance to industry and to the reconstruction efforts. So it, this role started in the 40s and 50s. The second role, which is also one of the original roles, uh, is funding for long-term projects, industrialization, and the capital development of the economy. We call, therefore, the capital development and ro role, or the developmental role, and also started in the 40s and 50s. The third role is targeting investment to high-risk R&D, innovative high-tech firms, and lengthy innovations, which are IRS that private capital has proved to be sh too short-termist to uh, venture. So we call it a venture capitalist role. That one was initiated uh, in the 50s uh, and the 60s, KFW, the Development Bank of Canada, and others started to provide targeted SME funding or target uh, funding for innovation. The Japanese Development Bank as well. The fourth one is promotion of investment that help address complex societal problems such as climate change. That's what we call the mission-oriented role. Something more recent, uh, we see it uh, uh, rising and becoming increasingly important in the 2000s. Uh, and the question is, how can we conceptualize this role in economic terms? The mainstream answer, uh, well, first I will provide some evidence. Sorry, I was jumping for how to explain them. I will provide some evidence. We see here in the case of a counter-cyclical role, 
the case of KFW, the purple bar there in 2009, 2010, and a bit in 2011 is the so-called special program that was approved uh, by the federal government to counter the credit crunch, the uh, low levels of industrial uh, utilization. 52 billion uh, w was uh, supplied to industry. There are other evidence. World Bank study shows that uh, on average, these institutions increased uh, funding by 36% during the crisis. Other studies show that in the 90s, these banks also pro provided counter cyclical finance to counter the several crises, like the Mexican crisis, Brazilian crisis, and others. BNDS in the 80s also acted counter cyclically because of the debt crisis in Brazil, and so forth. Um, the capital development role, this is some evidence uh, from BNDS. You see that BNDS is one of the most important uh, sources of funding for industry and infrastructure uh, after retained earnings. And in fact, uh, private institutions, they, their portfolio of loans, are 75% is short term, less than three years. Only 2% uh, is more than 15 years. In the case of BNDS, it's 36% is between 3 to 15 years, 10% is more than 15, per, 15 years. So they really are the key source of long-term finance in Brazil. The venture capitalist role, this is an uh, overview, a snapshot of KFW's venture capital investments. We see that they have increased in 2007 as well, and now they average uh, 10 billion euros. And in the case of Brazil, they have also some venture capital funds. One of the high techs is called Createch, which between 2005 to 2007 has averaged a return of 85% per year. So they are indeed successful in earning a return in their investments. And about the mission-oriented role, this is uh, data from the Climate Policy Initiative. We see that development finance institutions or state investment banks are the key single source of finance for climate change and adaptation and mitigation process. So the point is that these roles, they have a historical root, but they continue to these days. Some banks uh, do more than one than others, but they are what characterize the roles of investment banks in the economy state investment banks. So how do we explain these roles? Uh, the mainstream economic theory will uh, justify these roles as uh, basing market failure theory. So the, count, the coordination failure would give rise to a counter-cyclical role. There is the inter, intertemporal dynamics in capitalism uh, where preferences and expectations are not coordinated, private sector preferences and expectations are not coordinated, and uh, risk aversion of the private sector is pro-cyclical. There is an assumption that the state is risk neutral and can spread risk over time and cross-sectionally. The, the second failure is that that arises from public goods and network externalities, and uh, this leads to an undersupply of goods that are desirable from a societal point of view. The fourth one is a uh, more micro failure that arises from information symmetries, adverse selection, and this gives rise to the venture capitalist role. So innovation projects, because they are uncertain, they don't get the funding that they need, and they would therefore require the state to finance. And the fifth cause for, of these roles is negative externalities. So they are not reflected in the price system like climate change and therefore requires the state to intervene and provide the finance for projects that would help address these issues. This theory seems to justify an active role of the state. However, it also gives rise to a more uh, orthodox critique to what the state should do, because market failure will be a necessary but not sufficient cause for state intervention. The sufficiency would be if market failures would not lead to a worse failure, which is governmental failure. And there are four types also of governmental failure. The first one is financial repression and crowding out. So the assumption that uh, the funding comes from the same pool of savings would mean that uh, if the state takes a bit of these savings, that is less for the private sector. Or a more pro direct would be that 
the state in promote, uh, investing in R&D means that the private sector does not need to, in, to invest in R&D. They, they use the opportunity, the window of opportunity that would be available for the private sector. The second is misallocation of resources due to political biases. And that is the issue of rent seeking, cronyism, and so on. The third is the cap incapacity to pick winners. So the state would be not efficient and would actually uh, be incapable of picking winners. And the, the fourth is the inefficient governmental structures. So the, the state will not be as efficient as the private sector to, for instance, address a, a so societal problem. They, these uh, criticisms, they also can conceptually be attached to the four roles and the four market failures, but of course, they are not exclusive for one type. So beyond market failure. So the, the, we also then move to the heterodox um, view of these roles. And we argue that the, it's the issue that leads to the need of a counter cyclical role is not only of underinvestment, but of underutilization of labor and of that of financialization. It's not just an intertemporal dynamics, but a long term process that leads to this need. So we see authors like Keynes, Minsky talking about the socialization of investments as the only means to, to lead to full employment. We see the, the, the multiplier effect that fiscal policies can lead to a, a, a boom, economic boom through uh, triggering more investments from the private sector. In the case of the capital development role, it's not just a matter of uh, public goods like infrastructure and knowledge that are underfunded. It's a matter of creating Schumpeterian rents, those that arise from innovation. It's a matter of promoting the capital development, which requires also social capabilities. And this kind of coordination that state investment and banks provide between the uh, different actors is also important. And we see here the works from Schumpeter and other development economists. In the case of SMEs, the problem is that it's not just that SMEs cannot uh, get finance. The issue is identifying actually the SMEs that want to grow and they are high tech and are willing to, to get this finance. So it is a, a matter of a discovery process of promoting entrepreneurship, uh, steering and guiding those small companies and a matter of technical innovation. So it's not just a matter of uh, SMEs, but also those innovations. And finally, it's not just a matter of internalizing uh, costs, but making things happen, great transformations, transforming the system. And th for that, you need to really have uh, a more visionary capital, not just financial capital. You have Keynes, Polanski, and the mission-oriented literature. So uh, this leads to a, a reframing of the criticisms, which I will have to, to be very briefly. <coughs> Crowding out is a matter of empirical investigation, the misallocation of resources means that we need to, to increase uh, accountability as well, but uh, also to make the structure more complementary to the private sector. Um, and it, about the incapacity to pick winners, this could be rephrased as a matter of uh, adopting a portfolio approach and a matter of inefficient government structures. It means that you... Uh, need to see the process differently, not as a static process that needs, requires a cost-benefit analysis, but a dynamic process where a focus on economic efficiency per se is misleading. So as João yesterday mentioned, there is a, this new agenda of studying this kind of banks, of developing further this framework that we are now proposing. If you look, see the, the policy brief one that uh, Mariana has written, we talk about the issues of directionality, evaluation, risk rewards, and organization. They gave rise to some important questions. And avenues for further research, we, there is a development of new indicators that are able to capture the heterodox perspective, a comparison of other states' investment banks, try to find best practice, is this ever possible? and uh, in-depth studies to compare success and failed cases. Thank you. Very good, Cardano, and also very good that you commented on this new research agenda, which is, uh, and now we have Felipe Resende from HWS Colleges USA, talking about financial governance, banking, and financial stability in Brazil. 
uh, it's always a challenge to be the last one to present before lunch, so I'll, I'll be brief. But first, thanks to Randy Ray for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. An impressive lineup of speakers. Uh, just a quick announcement before I start this presentation. This work is part of a multi-year grant uh, awarded by the Ford Foundation. And next week, as Juan mentioned yesterday, BNDS will host a conference in Rio. And following that conference in Rio, Leonardo and I, we are organizing a workshop in which we will discuss uh, our projects. Uh, and of course, I will have more than 12 minutes to present the initial findings of uh, this project. So if you are in Rio next week, I encourage you to attend. Uh, we'll have the website link uh, right here. Uh, and we'll post presentations and all the uh, working papers to engage in dialogue. So it's right there. Well, before the global financial crisis, the 07, 08 global financial crisis, the approach <laughs> was the one in which we should adopt a system uh, or try to promote a financial system in which private finance would dominate. We would achieve that by encourage self-regulation, self-supervision, and financial deepening would pave the way for economic growth, right? So that was the understanding. Uh, most IMF policies, the Washington Consensus, among other things, they were encouraging, in particular, the developing nations to adopt that framework in order to promote economic development. That approach failed. Right? So that social experiment failed. We now know that we do need public institutions, in particular public banks, in order to work together with private finance in order to promote economic development. Right? So all those notions that private finance will be efficient in allocating resources is uh, discredited. Well, and then we have Minsky's main contributions, right? So if that approach failed, what is the alternative? Well, Minsky provided an alternative. Uh, Randy Ray this morning was talking about, and Turner yesterday was talking about Minsky's financial stability hypothesis. Ray uh, this morning was talking about that Minsky did more than that. He provided a states approach. Uh, uh, in particular, he has been using uh, the idea that when we have money matter capitalism, the system is inherently unstable actually is more unstable, but I'll add that he provided more than that. Minsky also provided a framework to analyze how financial systems change over time, and also he had much work, much, much of his work was on banking and financial regulation. So this project is combining all of those components and trying to analyze the Brazilian financial system, of course, given that we have our own needs, but using that uh, analytical framework. Right? So what are the lessons here? In a nutshell, for this project, I'm combining the notion we had for yesterday's uh, session. We had different ways that we can use innovation to promote innovation to drive growth. We had Pavlina this morning talking about ways that we have to support domestic demand. And we had, for example, Ray talking about ways that we have to reduce systemic instability. This project is combining all of those components. But today, I'll just talk about the role of public banks in Brazil in achieving those goals. So here's the basic question, right? Why does Brazil need BNDS, right? As uh, most of you know, BNDS in Brazil is under uh, heavy criticism, uh, even though it's an institution that has been around the corner for more than uh, 50 years, uh, but uh, it receives <coughs> lots of uh, criticism. Well, yesterday we, and. Uh, Andy was talking about, uh, talking about this during the first session, the first day, that to have this short-termism of financial markets. That's true in the UK, that's true in the US, and Brazil is no different, right? So even though we have that short-termism in Brazil for different reasons, uh, we cannot just use the UK approach and the one that we have in the US, but also have a short-termism -term in Brazil's financial market. And then in Brazil, people are the conventional uh, approach is that funding is very short, and you have a low duration concentration, low duration assets on banks' balance sheets, right? So we have this funding that's very short, and like Caetano was saying, uh, a few minutes ago, banks tend to concentrate their credit portfolio towards short-term loan instruments. Well, and then you look at the evolution of credit in the Brazilian financial system for the past decade, right? It roughly doubled. 
during the past decade, right? For both public and private banks. But here is an important point in which, even though it more than doubled, public and private banks, they play a different role. And that's the mission-oriented finance, one of the themes of this uh, meeting, uh, in which in Brazil, private banks, they tend to concentrate on consumer loans, while public banks, in particular BNDS, uh, and also our mortgage bank, which is also a public bank, tends to concentrate on long-term loans, right? So have this division between those two, and then is your question, why is that private banks are not willing to provide that finance or that funding to long-term assets, right? So we're trying to understand. So the goal here for this project was to go through banks' balance sheets, income statements, to understand how private and public banks operate, how they generate income, what are their funding costs, right? So was, we were looking at uh, the, the main banks and then understand how they do that, right? Their funding costs and their spreads. Now, <coughs> Luciano Coutinho was talking about that BNDS has an average maturity of its portfolio is about 10 years. For private bank, for the overall banking system is about 24 months as of 2010. 24 months, the maturity of credit in Brazil. Uh, and then the goal now is to understand why that's the case. And then people say that private banks are not extending long-term credit precisely because Benedias is there crowding out the private sector, right? That's the common belief. That's a common argument in Brazil, right? That Benedias is preventing the development of a long-term market in Brazil. And the reason for that, the argument goes, is due to its funding structure, right? So today I'll provide an alternative view that is uh, Benedias' advantage has nothing to do with its funding structure but with something else, which is in fact a source of efficiency in the system. And I'll talk about this uh, minutes. So then you ask this basic question. Uh, you have this idea that you need existing savings to finance investment. Rangel was talking about this, this notion that I have the loanable funds theory, which is a myth. So I ask this question, you have lack of savings in Brazil and funding instruments, or that concentration is due to short-term portfolio preferences towards low duration assets. And then you know, the basic question should be why is that to have a preference for those uh, low duration assets? And here's my explanation, right? It's mainly due to two things. One, those short term loan products, they generate extremely high spreads in Brazil, right? So you can see here in the early 2000s, it used to be uh, about 20% just the spread between banks' funding costs, right? So the bottom line is banks' total, like banks in the aggregate funding cost, and then have the loan portfolio yield is that blue line that I doubt that you can see it. And that spread reduced, and it reduced mainly because public banks, and that was due to government actions to precisely reduce those spreads, right? And also the interest rate was falling throughout the decade, but also that was mainly due to policy, right? To have a reduction spreads, was about 20% between banks' funding cost and the average loan portfolio yield, right? By the way, that average, so you have an idea for overdraft loans in Brazil is about 250% per year. Credit card loans is about 250 as well, right? So that's the average rate. It can be much higher than that for certain loan products, all right? Now it's reduced, but it's still high compared to international standards. So banks, they generate, they have extremely high uh, loan spreads. And if you compare to international peers, they have one, high capital ratios compared to international peers, which is a source of stability in the system. And they operate with extremely low leverage. Brazil is the green one at the very bottom on the right hand side of that picture, right? Extremely low leverage for Brazilian banks. And in spite of all that, they generate extremely high returns on equity. Extremely high returns on equity. And again, low leverage. Remember, US banks are running Extremely high return on equity because they leverage all the way up. In Brazil, we don't need to do that. And then you ask why? Well, in the private system, we have two things going on. Banks, private banks, extremely inefficient for primarily two reasons. As I doubt it, again, that you can see it, but it's online. If you compare Brazil relative to international peers, banks in Brazil, they, op they have extremely high operating costs. 
right? It's the last column over there. Extremely high, right? Extremely expensive, uh, the banking business in Brazil. And that's operating costs. It has nothing to do with funding. It's operating costs, right? The other fact is that they have extremely high delin delinquency rates, loan loss provisions, right? Inside the private system. Right? When you combine those two things, then it's necessary to have extremely high spreads so that you have <coughs> high margins. Right? And there is another study, if you want to go beyond that, right, to see if it's possible to reduce the spreads inside the private banking system, we have a study here comparing uh, the most important banks, the largest banks in the world, and then I have Brazil and other banks. And then you see that for the left one, that's the average spread. Brazilian banks, the three largest banks, are the very top, right, compared to international peers. And then the second column, you have operating costs, extremely high relative to international peers. And then those three bars over there for returns on equity, they generate extremely high return on equity. While in other banking systems, they can operate with extremely low spreads, but they have extremely low operating costs, and they're able to generate high return on act, uh, returns on equity as well. And then you ask, what is BNDES's competitive advantage? And here's my take. BNDES, if you look at BNDES balance sheet and it's uh, all the reports that we have on its uh, website, BNDES is able to operate, to fund long-term assets with extremely low loan spreads, right? The spread between funding and its portfolio yield is extremely low. And in spite of that, Benny Diaz is able to generate extremely high returns on equity, as one was talking uh, before, due to its portfolio, right? So that's an important factor here and it's a source of efficiency, right? As an example, if you go to other loan products, if you look at private banks' balance sheets, for example, for housing, mortgage loans, which you have a cap for those loans, you have extremely low spreads for those products for private banks, and that's primarily the reason they don't invest in housing in Brazil, private banks. Most of the housing is financed by public banks, the mortgage bank, right? And just to, to finish, we have a second factor, which is related to the duration, the interest rate risk that banks carry on their balance sheets. And here we have the CEO of Brazil's largest private bank saying that, look, we will not finance long-term assets in the way that was done in the United States. That is, he was saying, look, we will not finance long-term assets using deposits. What he was saying is that he's not willing to carry the interest rate risk on its balance sheet, right? And why is that? Well, just to give you an idea why that's the case, in Brazil, we have extremely high interest rate volatility for a number of reasons that are not going to detail. And that interest volatility, just to give an example, Last year, during the second quarter of 2013, banks, they had on their portfolios long-term bonds, Brazilian securities, right, government securities. And when interest rates changed last year, they had to report those three banks, the largest uh, private banks, Bradesco, Itaú, and Santander, they reported losses just due to change in interest rates, due to, of course, market-to-market -market accounting, that was equal to $5 billion in just one quarter, right? So it's that interest rate volatility that's preventing the extension of duration, right? That is, that banks will buy long-term assets because if they do so, then they have to report massive losses, right? And I participated in that conference call. Those guys are having an extremely hard time to explain why that was the case to their investors, why they had to report such losses. So again, there's another factor here, which is the interest rate uh, risk exposure that banks are not willing to do, and then have to come up with alternative ways, that is to bring pension funds, insurance companies, which are natural uh, buyers of those assets, and also the BNDES as an important role to play in the economic development of the Brazilian economy. Thank you. Okay, so we now have about maximum 10 minutes. If you can just ask brief questions, if you want to address them to a particular speaker, please. I will start here on the right. Bill? Uh, yeah, just uh, Danny, uh, you may know this, but uh, there was one place uh, uh, in Schumpeter in an article he wrote in the 40s where he says the state in the United States played an entrepreneurial role in ag agriculture. And I, in fact, wrote, I wrote an article 
uh, quite a long time ago called the Managerial Revolution Developmental State, and uh, the U.S. state implemented your model. Uh, so it was, it was the number of stages, but starting with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, experiment stations, and then the last stage was 1914, an act that created all these county agents, thousands of them, that went to all the, the, the basically the units of production, collected data, brought back the, the latest technologies, and this raised uh, uh, productivity agriculture. The final thing, since we're talking about finance, however, just, uh, just one point on this, farmers who adopted the latest technologies and then tried to get productivity up with, with machinery went bankrupt. So the last stage, which was the New Deal, they had to put financial instruments in there uh, to uh, control prices and to give them mortgages. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like to say? Uh, thank you. Very short story. I went to speak uh, in Kuala Lumpur on sustainability in Southeast Asia and visited a little island called Pulau Ridang. Uh, on further inspection, um, it is a protected area, a conservation zone. Uh, it turned out that there is an enormous amount of rubbish on the beach. Um, the oil is burned to power air conditioning uh, in the hotels which charge about 300 pounds uh, per night. Uh, the preferred mode of transportation is a motorbike uh, and uh, you know the, the water in the jungle has a strange soapy color. My question is about the strategic priorities and directions. How can we make sure that uh, you know all these flows of investment will go towards the solution of the most pressing uh, problems that the world is facing now and for instance not uh, more oil exploration? Very good. The you. question is to uh, no, I would like to okay, take. Behind you. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, hello. I got a question for Caetano. Um, I come from an organization primarily uh, monitoring the European Investment Bank. I have a bit more critical view as whether they're uh, able to, to really take on this entrepreneurial uh, task. One of the main reasons that uh, investment banks have been growing is because the state, because of con uh, constraints of, of states' budgets, and while the banks have uh, taken on the more traditional banking role, uh, I'm not sure whether they um, are f fully entrepreneurial. For example, um, they have a, a profit-making uh, goal. They have a triple A rating to protect, which makes, makes them more risk-averse. Um, they are the EIB is, for example, a demand-driven bank, meaning that they mainly wait for projects to come to them in, in, instead of proactively looking for them. Uh, they have definitely greened their um, portfolio, but they also finance still fossil fuel lock-ins in, in the form of pipelines, LNG terminals, etc. Um, they also, um, the, for example, their main uh, anti-crisis measure was um, as a me lending through um, through uh, private banks, but with very little strings attached. Not clear where which as a me's were targeted. I mean, and I, I can go on um, sure. okay, a little more you. like that. So, um, your reaction, please. Have you have you done a comparison between them and the private banks? That's my question to you. Um, yes. Get a microphone there, please. Is it okay if we just take a lot of questions? Yeah? Can I ask um, Caetano, please, to go into more detail uh, on his uh, response to the criticism that uh, the orthodox criticism that state banks are um, crowding out private investment? Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, please. IB, which was just mentioned now, uh, could better work together, or what the view is? I mean, how do, they, how should they best <coughs> collaborate, cooperate, or would they together maybe, uh, perhaps do crowd out? I don't know. Is there any view on that? Very good. Is there anybody else? Or that's it. Um, lunch beckons, I think. So should we go again from left to right? Is that okay? Or do you want to follow the? Model. No innovation. No innovation. Uh, I have these two points. One is not to 
precisely answering the question of uh, how can we assure that uh, the directionality, etc., is right? Because there, I, I don't think that there is a, a clear answer to that. I think that the way to to raise the question uh, in my perception is uh, to ask uh, what are the institutional conditions or what is the institutional design that makes the government or the state part of the solution and what are conversely or, or the institutional you know, conditions or the institutional the, the design that makes the state part of the problem because it can be both. The state can be part of the problem or part of the solution. What I, I think we cannot deny is that in, in looking at processes of modernization, economic modernization, industrialization, etc., the state was always there. So that I think is the point. And just a small clarification in between what Dan was saying and uh, what I was saying uh, is I think that it's really kind of complementary because you were talking mostly about startups and innovation, etc. And my point was a much broader one, which was sort of the entrepreneurial state as a state which uh, takes care and leads in much more like fronts and deals with much more issues than that. So it doesn't really collide with what you're saying. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, I'll be very brief, trying to merge a few of the comments I have. Um, I agree with you, Bill, that the U.S. has been really important a couple of times. Uh, and indeed it was, uh, and also DARPA, for example, which is now famous, uh, it's most of its successes was when almost no one heard about it. Uh, once people heard about it, W and his administration tried to put it under control. So the question is, how do you then allow experimentation? In the US, which is a great example, but also in Europe. Uh, and I think part of what we might be able to learn from China is if you look at China's development until very recently, what it allowed is allowed a huge amount of experimentation in the local level. Most of the policies were not you have to do A, B, or C, but you're now allowed to try to do different things in different regions have tried them differently. When they work, they were gone to the center. And just as an example, if you look at the plans for the telecommunications, you will find out that uh, Huawei was not even there, and that ZTE was supposed to be a peripheral company. But the state, the Shenzhen city state, that supported both of them, supported them very successfully, and indeed the central state said thank you and make an international champion. Mm -hmm. And I think this is part of what AIB, um, a, sorry, EIB, ADB, and other banks can allow, allow a lot of experimentation in regions, and then hopefully some will be successful. That's a nice point. Can I just say very briefly, you say that the state budget is, is cannot be used because uh, a Europe is, has been in crisis, and that therefore they use the IB. Well, you imply that that's a bad thing, um, but you know, you, you, you do this and you have leverage, uh, both in public resources and with the private sector, um, and it's not necessarily um, a bad thing. So I, I would just urge people when they are comparing uh, when they're talking about public development banks, for example, uh, to, to use the same matrix that of comparison as with private banks. Because often the criticism is against some kind of ideal that doesn't exist. So I think we'll have to compare. Um, and before I, I ask China to answer, if I may very quickly just suggest that maybe um, the, the argument of market failure which is a slightly negative argument, um, can be incorporated into a more dynamic vision. I mean, and not be seen as a contradiction, but something that we, you can build on and develop. Because then you will get a broader audience of people agreeing with. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I agree with you that uh, the, the issue that uh, 
not, is, the issue is not an issue that the uh, budgets are constrained and then you use uh, development banks as they are actually yeah. the alternative. You know, what's the difference maybe between the debt level of Germany and Greece? Well, the difference is maybe KFW, whose uh, debt who, who's doesn't count as a sovereign debt. So I think that that's a, a, a good way. Maybe if Greece had a development bank as effective as KFW, they wouldn't be in that situation. And I will try to answer about those criticisms. Uh, yeah, in fact, we don't have a single model for development banks. So some accept deposits, others don't. Some are demand-led, others have a, a more a clearer mandate. That's why we started with a very conceptual framework to understand these banks. And then from there, you go to those uh, more empirical uh, analysis of what they do and actually whether those criticisms hold or not. So there is a theoretical argument for why these criticisms uh, happen, th these issues happen, and there is also an empirical investigation. So I think in particular in the case of crowding out, you can say that, uh, well, if you don't assume that investments are financed uh, through savings, then actually crowding out is not really a big issue in theoretical terms. However, that is a, I think that crowding out uh, is also an, an issue of empirical investigation. And if you find that actually the, the money for such investments will not come from the private sector, then crowding out cannot exist. So, and um, yeah, uh, I will Very end good. here. Felipe, you have less than two minutes. The time police tells you. Uh, yeah, just to add on this notion of uh, crowding out, uh, even without relying on empirical results, so that's the way that banks operate, they buy an asset and an issue on liability. That was uh, in Minsky, as the endogenous money literature, uh, they just create money. They issue private IOUs, they don't rely on existing savings to finance those assets, right? So that's the credit system, that's the monetary system, the way it works is not dependent upon the existence of uh, prior savings. They can finance uh, anything if it's profitable, if they des uh, de decide to do so. So uh, this idea that's crowding out uh, neglects the way that the monetary system uh, works and the credit system works as well. So that's uh, the take. And I'll disagree with Kaitan about uh, Germany and Greece. Uh, they are actually on the same boat. They are, are both uh, uh, users of the currency. They're not the issuers of the currency, but that's a, a different story. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I think we had a